Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing energy matters in an informal setting. This week we return to a topic that has been making headlines and moving markets across Europe's wholesale energy markets, regulatory intervention. While we won't get full visibility about the EU policy measures until the end of this month when EU energy ministers are scheduled to meet, most of the proposals are on the table focusing chiefly on perceived market design failures, separating gas prices from electricity, lowering demand and boosting supply. Helping me, Richard Sverson, to make sense of the market interventions proposed by the European Commission is Montel's Brussels correspondent, Siobhan Hall. A warm welcome to you, Siobhan. Thank you, Richard. Um, before we start, I, I think it would be good to clarify exactly what the European Commission sees as a need of repair? I mean, does it, does it think the market is broken? That's a very good question, Richard. What we have heard recently is European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen saying that the market is no longer fit for purpose. But I think it's important to distinguish here between two work streams, as it were. So we have seen proposals come out last week which are very much emergency, urgent proposals. And at the same time, the Commission is working on longer term reforms of the electricity market. So we've got two things going at the same time, urgent measures now, and then we will have to wait and see what the longer term measures are. But the Commission has definitely said it wants to reform the electricity market so that it does see a problem. Some of these are temporary and others are much more permanent then? Yes, so we will be focusing on the urgent measures now, and then the longer term measures will require longer approval process. And so they won't come into effect for a year or two years or possibly even three years time. So there are things that are going to be happening this winter. And then there will be rules that will change where the impact will be later. But I expect that when people see what the impact of rules this winter was, that will also influence the longer term rules. Mm. So there'll be some kind of interplay between the, the two measures, you reckon? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, obviously things on, on when you're making permanent changes to s things like market design, it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, these, these things take years within the EU. The cogs of Brussels get into effect and that, that obviously take, takes time. But um, which, from your perspective, you know, you're on the ground in Brussels, you follow it very closely, Siobhan. What, you know, what elements of the current market design does it want to change or does it deem uh, not fit for purpose? So the key problem at the moment is the high gas prices affecting power prices. And as we know, the current market design is all about the merit order. So the cheapest power plants come on first to meet demand and marginal pricing. So basically at the moment, gas fire plants tend to be the most expensive plant. When they come online, they set the price for all the generators who have already provided power, who have lower costs. And so what you see is the generators who have those lower cost technologies, that could be things like nuclear, renewables, uh, lignite uh, plants, they're all making lots of money at the moment in principle because they're gaining from this very high marginal price which is being set by the gas plant. And so one of the proposals from the Commission is to use some of those, what it would see as excess revenues over what those low cost generators could have expected and use those excess revenues to give financial support to customers who are suffering from the, the high energy prices. And this can be done at an EU level across the board? Yes. So the goal is that they, what they have proposed is an EU wide cap on revenues for those lower cost generators. And they've set it at 180 euros per megawatt hour, which they argue is well above the level that the people who invested in the low cost generation would have expected to get a as a return. So their, their argument is you're getting plenty of money to cover your costs and to make the investment decisions that you would have made anyway. We're just saying if it goes, anything that goes above this level will be taken by governments 
to help solve this urgent, immediate problem that we're expecting this winter. Mm. And was that is that level is it an arbitrary level? I mean, it's the the initially they were talking about two hundred euros a megawatt hour, weren't they? And they've come down to one hundred and eighty. Is that due to sort of some, you know, w- why is that change? Do you know why they made that change? Um, I don't know why they made that change, but you made the point at the beginning that we won't know what the final what the final rules will be until the EU energy ministers have had a chance to say what they think of proposals. So there's always the possibility that they may change this level of 180 megawatt hours, 180 euros per megawatt hour. What the Commission says in its proposal is that uh, national governments are also free to set a lower level if they want. So if they have a generation system which has particularly low costs, they could set their revenue cap at a lower level in in order to generate, in order to skim off more revenues to help customers. So yes, this is one of the things we don't really know until member states agree it and then start implementing it. So I would take the 180 euros per megawatt hour as the headline figure for now, and we'll know more in the weeks to come. Uh, absolutely, it's still a little bit unclear, but how would this be administered or, or managed? Do you, is there any any sort of clarity on that at all, Siobhan? No, not really, because the Commission has also made the proposal at the moment so that national governments would have some flexibility in the way that they administer it. So flexibility at the point where they would they would make the calculation or the point that they would collect the revenues or how they would collect the revenues. At the moment, it's really not clear how that will happen. It's been left, as far as I understand, deliberately vague at the moment um, to give member states the opportunity to decide, is it going to be through regulators? Is it going to be through some uh, other national authority? It would be really up to the member states to decide on those rules. So obviously, that's quite a lot of uncertainty for utilities and power generation power generators because not only will they have to wait and see what the ministers decide that would go into the proposal, but then they'll have to wait again to see what their own national government will decide on how to implement it at a national level. Mm. No, interesting. I mean, uh, I think, you know, you mentioned the the marginal pricing model and the merit order, that, that the way that sort of governed the way wholesale energy markets have worked for, for decades now, ever since we've been covering these markets, Siobhan. So that, do you think, you, you know, this is not, that this temporary measure is not putting an end to that, if you like? I think it's going to be clearly a practical example of how a change to the market design might work, uh, or what, or rather what a change to the market, what impact the cha- a change to the market design would have. It, it's not a new idea to change the marginal pricing. As soon as people began to see that there were going to be higher shares of renewables in the system, the call to change the marginal pricing model was coming from various groups well before there was this temporary emergency caused by by many factors. But in the past, the Commission has always defended marginal pricing. ACER, the EU regulatory agency, has also in the past defended marginal pricing as being a good way to encourage people to invest in lower cost technologies. You know, the idea is with the marginal pricing, you only use your most expensive part for a short short period of time, and you're creating bigger revenues for the lower cost generators, which would imply an incentive to invest in lower cost generation. So it's interesting. I mean, clearly, they are going to be proposing something, we're expecting longer term proposals in January, they're going to be proposing something which will be different from what has gone before. I mean, we, we a couple of episodes ago on, on, on the podcast, we I talked to Stephen Woodhouse of, of AFRI and he, he was a staunch defender of the marginal uh, pricing model. Um, but I think it's clear now that the commission sees the end in sight is is there if you like for for the marginal pricing or or maybe some adjustments i mean um uh you know not not fit for purpose is quite this is quite quite strongly worded yeah so as you know renewables tend to require a lot of upfront capital investment and they have low marginal costs to run and that's a very different market business model from the Generate from the gen from the technologies that the market has been designed around for previous decades. 
Um, I mean, it's still not clear. I don't know if it's if it's clear yet what a good alternative would be, but clearly, as the clearly as the share of renewables goes up, and that is something that the Commission definitely wants. The the, the Commission definitely wants the share of renewables to go up. Um, it would be. It seems likely that the Commission would need to address some of the issues that come with having a share of renewables which is heading towards 60 70 percent of the overall um, power market and you know and and back in the day there was talk of when people talked about 100 percent renewable system it was considered very extreme but now it seems it doesn't seem so extreme at all so there are lots of things that have lots of positions that have moved a lot in terms of what people think is is feasible or not um, in the last few years. I mean, the Commission, they only redesigned the market, the EU power markets a few years ago. And then they said it's to help integrate larger quantities of renewables, but they're going to have to come again and go, and we want to integrate even larger quantities of renewables. So we need to tweak the rules again. So starting from scratch again, or um, building on what they've done before? I think it, must, it will have to be building on what's gone before because the EU power market is so complex. And that's one of the things that you hear a lot when people are discussing the policy interventions and when commission officials are discussing it. They often refer to how complex the power markets are and how they spent years obviously creating as integrated an EU power market as they can. And because you now have this very large, generally integrated market, then any changes you make affect a lot of people at the same time. So it is something that they're not going to do. They're not going to, they're not going to rush any of the longer term reforms. They've had to rush to come up with these emergency measures, but they're very much saying for all the longer term ref reforms, we need very thorough analysis. And of course, those longer term reforms would have plenty of time to be discussed and debated by all the actors um, in the system. And going through all the due processes and yeah. consultations, yeah. etc. Yeah. yeah, because yeah. obviously with the emergency measures, it's it's under an emergency provision, which means only national governments need to agree on it. But anything longer term would have to be agreed by the European Parliament as well as national governments. And, you know, and that process opens up to a much more diverse and longer um, debate. Mm. I mean, if we return to the, the short term sort of emergency uh, policy interventions that are, that are coming or we'll get clarity on in a couple of weeks, Siobhan, how have those been received both in Brussels and beyond? So the gut reaction of most people involved in markets is that interventions in markets by national governments, generally speaking, is bad. <laughs> And um, mm. and I think even if mm. when they, I, I saw some stories that, um, you know, people are concerned that it would affect long term investment decisions. And um, and, and I think it's just obviously the, the basic principle of if you're an investor, you're always you're always quite unhappy when governments start interven intervening in your market because you're never you're never quite sure what the outcome will be and where it will end. So um generally speaking the principle of the market intervention is not particularly light these actual market interventions perhaps they've set the cap high enough that it won't actually cause a problem for people and if it is temporary and short term and everyone does see that there is a problem with high prices and very high prices don't necessarily help companies in the way that you might think because we know uh, for utilities and so on, as the power price goes up, the amount of collateral they have to put forward in order to be able to trade power goes up. So it's not a case of high prices mean mean someone wins without any other issues. And and certainly the um, the proposals around helping to sustain liquidity in the market and helping companies with the collateral they are generally welcomed hmm. no absolutely i mean uh, you, you know we also we talked about this podcast about the winners and the losers and there's some spectacular losers and some spectacular winners as well if you're you have very very low marginal costs and you're reaping you know you're you're generating at you know, or receiving 
revenues 500 euros a megawatt hour above you know i think you're, you're certainly um uh, making i think it'd be fair to say sort of excess profits or profits unimaginable when you invested in those facilities anyway i think that would be yeah. fair to say um but there are some other proposals on the table and one which didn't quite make it in the end there was this the the the, the price cap on russian gas imports what what happened there Siobhan? so the price cap on russian imports is something that the commission is is keen on because it it keeps talking about it. Uh, the problem is that the countries in in the EU all have a different level of dependency on Russian gas, and some are more worried about the impact of a full Russian gas cut off than others. And we know that Putin, Vladimir, the Russian president Vladimir Putin, has said if there's a gas price cap that's it, they'll stop supplying gas to the EU. So that is, that is um, that threat is more or less severe depending on how much you depend on the Russian gas that still flows. The Commission's view, so the reason the Commission hasn't proposed it um, so far is essentially they don't have enough support for it and they don't have enough support for what they have at the moment so they, they will have to come, they will have to keep working at it to see if they can come up with something that, can, that would get consensus from enough EU countries in order to in order to fly. From what I've seen, the Commission's position is given that the Russian gas flows have reduced so much just in this year. So it was about, you know, Russian Russia was supplying, say, about 40% of the EU gas last year. It's down to about 9%, I think, at the moment. Um, and so the Commission's point of view is it's much lower than it was before. Let's put a cap on it and take the risk that they might shut it off. But let's put the cap at a level where it would be in it would still be in Russia's interest to supply because they would they don't make any money if they cut it off entirely. If they supply at the cap, they would still be making they would still be making money. So it's difficult to know how that one will go. Um, it really depends on yeah. It really depends on how certain countries react and whether they can wait, whether they, I think the commission would have to find a way to reassure certain countries that if there was a full cut off in Russian gas, that if they gamble and lose, that those countries will be looked after by the other countries. So it's a question of, of solidarity and whether the commission can really reassure them that they won't be the ones to take the brunt of the adverse impacts if if Russia decides to cut mm. off gas. So those priority. countries, you mean sort of mainly Eastern and Central Europe, uh, Italy even maybe? Um... Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it would, yeah, I would say those countries to the East of Europe who have historically been more dependent on Russian gas. I mean, Italy obviously is, has other options, but it's a bigger gas demand has a higher gas demand. You know, the Eastern European countries, a lot of the small Eastern European countries don't have very high gas demand relative to, say, Italy or, or um, uh, Germany. But if they can't find, if, if you can't get alternative supplies to them, then they will suffer more. Italy has at least has some more options to source from other supplies. Another measure that was flying around was that the sort of so-called Spanish intervention, which was, you know, uh, capping the price of gas for, for those that generate from that fuel in the wholesale market. But uh, that doesn't seem to have made it to the EU, EU level. No, um, I suppose the... So there's this other proposal, which is to require oil and gas companies to pay a portion of their excess profits as a, as a contribution, which to governments which could also be used to help um, support end users and customers. So it's that's different in the sense that it's a it, it applies to all companies with EU activities who are active in oil or gas or refining um, and and who have benefited from the high uh, fossil fuel prices. And that would be that they would have to make a contribution based on their excess profits and excess profits being profits that are at least 20 percent higher this year than they have been over the previous i think it's three years 
So that's another way of clawing back some money from people who wouldn't necessarily have expected that money anyway, and using it again to subsidize end users who are facing the high prices. Is there a feeling in Brussels at all, Siobhan, that, you know, amongst sort of energy lobby groups and, and, and firms that, you know, that the energy sector has to bear the brunt of these kind of interventions, that other sectors are also making quite a lot of profit in the current environment, say, for example, the pharmaceutical but pharmaceutical industry. But has, has, um, uh, ha- has there been any kind of criticism or, or sort of grumbling of discontent from, from, the, from the energy sector in Brussels? I think a lot of the discussion at policy level is based on the fact that high energy prices tend to inflate prices in other sectors. So because energy is at the base of a lot of other products, and so the price of chemicals or steel or whatever goes up because energy prices go up. And obviously we've seen very high inflation rates. So from a policy level, the energy sector is the root cause and tackling tackling the issues in the energy sector or finding ways to mitigate the impacts of this problem in the energy sector is where they want to go. Um, I'm, I haven't seen much about other sectors, but I'm a specialist, so I haven't looked. So I can't tell you. <laughs> no. No, no, exactly. I mean, it was a bit of a long shot there, Shimon, but I think also, and the and the, the 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 key factor here is, of course, that you know you you know these prices and the the prices that are forecast to come in the retail sector for the for the coming six months or year will plunge a lot of households into fuel poverty, and obviously that's something that uh, uh, commission and policymakers want to avoid at all costs, and that's that's a huge factor here. Um, uh, but there are other proposals aren't there there's demand cuts uh, can you talk us through those what it what the commission was, uh, has, uh, has planned or proposed yeah so the proposals on demand cuts are that um i mean the key proposal on demand cuts is really this an effort to cut the cut peak demand because peak demand is normally the one that's fulfilled by expensive gas plants so the idea is if you can shift demand away from the peak not only do you not have to um pay the prices that are set by gas-fired plant. But also, if you're not using those gas-fired plants, then you're not using as much gas overall. So it also feeds into the goal of using less gas generally uh, this winter. So those, as the Commission has proposed it, those peak demand cuts would be binding. And they're looking for a 5% reduction in peak demand on about uh, I think it's about 10% of peak demand hours. So that's the really targeted goal. And it's interesting that they're saying that should be binding because when the commission came before the summer with some proposals to reduce gas demand this winter, they, when they made the proposal, they proposed it as we want national governments to attempt to cut their gas demand, it's voluntary. And and if that if they don't manage to achieve it, only then will we talk about making it binding. But with the electricity market, this goal to try and cut peak demand is so urgent and so important. They're coming straight with, we want this to be binding and we want you to agree to to this as a binding goal. And then they have a non-binding, a voluntary goal to cut overall electricity demand by, by 10%. But it's really the peak demand because you have this double whammy that you're you're helping the price is not rise so high because you're not using gas by a plant and you're also saving the gas that would have been in those used by those gas by plant. So it's an indication, if you like, uh, how urgent and how completely uh, what an emergency situation it is really so that they have to, 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 to change this, this language from from sort of non, from binding, um, so non-binding to binding uh, and mandatory. Yeah, um, uh, absolutely. Sure. Very interesting. But at the same time, they're also looking to, to, to boost supply. I mean, uh, you know, um, you wrote a story for us about, um, uh, you know, the EU getting together a task force working with Norway to to try and increase gas. Can you talk us through what what was that all about? So they, so the Commission said they've been in talks with uh, Norway just to see whether they can find a way to reduce um, gas prices 
Um, and there's a task force. They set up a task force to do this. Um, I mean, because one of the problems, this sort of uh, comes back to the, in some ways, to the, the talk we, what we were saying about the gas price cap. I mean, the commission is sort of wary on a, of a gas price cap generally because they want to attract gas to Europe. And obviously, at LNG, so not pipeline gas, but LNG that is being shipped, we're in competition with other parts of the world. So Norway, we're getting mostly pipeline gas. And so we're looking at ways whether the Commission wants to look at ways with Norway, whether they can find a way to sell that gas in a way which is not so expensive. Um, but at the same time, make sure that European gas prices are high enough that it will attract LNG. And then that also brings us to an interesting proposal for the Commission where they're also looking at whether it's worth having a separate index for LNG gas from the pipeline gas because they see a disconnect now between the two markets because the pipeline gas is um, being affected very much by the Russian by the fall in Russian gas flows and LNG markets are affected by what goes on in the rest of the world. So whether that will happen or not, again, you don't get an index overnight. So no, exactly. I mean, this is, are, that can't be discussions. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to say that can't be one of the short term emergency measures. No. That's, that's that's more a long term issue, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. I think um, I think I think market participants will, you know, will eagerly wait for more more clarity on that because that's a clear intervention into the me mechanics of the wholesale market, which there hasn't really been on the table before, has it, in such a way? So actually, the Commission has been interested in an LNG index for, for a few years now, when it started to see the share of LNG in the market start to tick up. But obviously, again, this is quite a recent phenomenon. You know, as we know, a few years ago, a lot of LNG terminals were well under capacity for imports. So there are a lot of plates spinning at the same time and um yes well i think the thing that i really notice in these current days is a lot of ideas that were milling around for some years but not getting much um credence or backing are now rising to the top and we're hearing things that a few years ago people would have thought there's no way that would happen and now they're being proposed and people are agreeing to it. So, I mean, it's really interesting time to be <laughs> to be looking at this. Exactly. Some, some, I don't know whether to call them wacky ideas, but certainly some of these kind of ideas are getting more traction now. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'm sure we'll turn to this, return to this topic again um, in a few months' time, Siobhan. But thanks very much for enlightening on us on what's what's actually happening on the on on Brussels and what the thinking is. So, um, thank you very much for being part of the Monto Weekly Podcast this week. Thank you, Richard. So listeners, you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, aptly named the Monto Weekly Podcast. Please direct message, any suggestions, questions, or, you know, let us know if you, if you think you have a good idea for a guest on the show. You can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com. Lastly, remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in energy markets on Montel News. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you and goodbye.